and the APSS, I welcome you all to this program of ASSI APSS Global Outreach. At the outset, my sincere thanks to the ASSI and its president, Dr. Swayam Ajit Basu, and to APSS and its president, Professor Moon, for agreeing to collaborate uh, on the topic of uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. My sincere thanks to B Bombay Spine Society for this uh, organizing this event. And I would like to invite Professor S.K. Srivatsava, the president-elect of the ASSI, to give the welcome address. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. A very good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of ASSI and Bombay Spine Society, I warmly welcome all of you. The scientific committee of ASSI and the organizing committee of BSS, which is going to actually uh, you know, conduct this SECON 2024, has decided multiple global outreach program. And today we are fortunate that APSS is collaborating with us. I am really fortunate and it is my proud privilege to welcome all the faculties of ASSI and APSS to this session. It is a very important session, ASI, AIS, that is the Adolescent Idiopathic Scoliosis. The pathogenesis and the treatment strategy has been ever evolving. And today we are going to see and listen the galaxy of these faculties. And I thank you, all of you, for attending this. Now I hand over the uh, proceeding to Dr. Ajay Sethi and Dr. Khan, who are going to you know, chair this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor SKS. I would like to invite uh, Professor Kwan to give his welcome address. You are muted. Yeah, thanks, Ajoy. So on behalf of APSS, I'd like to welcome all of you to the ASSI APSS Global Outreach ses Session. Uh, team is on idiopathic scoliosis. And the APSS is very grateful to be able to participate in this cooperative educative event. All right, APSS as a whole are very committed to provide education as well as research for spine care around this region. So we are very happy to participate you know, in this type of event. So I would thank the ASSI, BSS for you know, inviting APSS to join this session. And I certainly sincerely hope that this session will be a good educative uh, a session for all of us. Thank you again, uh, everyone here. Thank, thank you, Professor Kwan. Uh, without uh, wasting much time, I would like to invite the moderators, Dr. Dheeraj Sonawane and Dr. Jason to further conduct the proceedings. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ajay, sir. Uh, so I will welcome everybody for this uh, APSS, ASS, APSS ASI Outreach, Global Outreach Program. Uh, so I'll call on my uh, co-moderator and the first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Jason, to speak on uses of skeletal maturity for assessment in management in AIS. Uh, thank you, Josh, for the introduction and uh, very glad to be part of this uh, excellent program. Uh, happy to uh, share some of uh, my my thoughts over the uh, over the years and some of the research we've done regarding uh, the use of skeletal maturity for management of AIS. Oh, it's not moving. Okay. So I think first of all, uh, we need to understand a little bit more about uh, understand a little bit about the puberty, the pubertal growth spurt. Um, so. Uh, there are three stages in uh, all children and um, the period that we're most usually most interested in as uh, spine uh, surgeons is the gonadotarchy uh, period in which uh, you will probably see patients go undergoing the greatest uh, growth um, due to the increase in the gonadosteroids and that's exactly where you see a lot of the secondary uh, secondary sexual uh, characteristics being formed uh, patients enter menarche at this stage um, so in this period, uh, it was coincides with the adolescent growth spurt. So uh, with the uh, release of the sexual hormones, you'll see a, a great increase in longitudinal growth of patients, um, and it's generally dose at this planet. So in the early pubertal phase, you see a low dose increase of, uh, for example, estrogen and testosterone, which stimulates a lot of growth. And when it reaches a very peak period, um, the growth will stop, which is the end of uh, pubertal growth spurt. Testosterone generally is released later than estrogen, which is why boys enter growth spread later than girls. Uh, but in general, you see a very similar trend of uh, 
a bell-shaped curve uh, reaching to a gradual uh, period of uh, reduced growth at the end of um, maturity. Um, clinical parameters in assessment. Um, we usually do look at various height measurements. Um, I think uh, secondary sexual characteristics are probably the most accurate form of assessment of pubertal growth. However, we probably rarely actually look at these uh, in the clinical practice. So most of us do look at uh, different height measurements, but they're generally retrospective. And um, menarche, of course, uh, indicates only the end of peak height velocity, which is not as uh, useful um, for predicting growth. Um, there are some cases in which there would be post menarche deterioration. So this is a case you can see here um, with menarche uh, and post menarche six months, that's when the progression actually occurs. So it's not a very accurate measurement, but it's a good tool for us to indicate which patients are at higher risk of progression. Uh, we do know RISR sign is generally um, very well used uh, around the world, but it is uh, gen uh, noted to be quite unreliable. So you, it's not often, it's quite common for you to see cases such as this in which patients present with a, a low grade of RISR, but you can see that uh, the phalangiophyses are all actually fused already. So RISR sign doesn't actually fuse in concurrence uh, with uh, the other um, uh, phys uh, growth physes at the same time. Um, there are also some limitations in, uh, in terms of growth cessation. So you can see that uh, in some cases, they've never fused and uh, some patients actually fuse in um, early adulthood. So it's not very useful in terms of uh, uh, predicting when growth ends. Um, uh, Grizzard zero, of course, is uh, a very longitudinal uh, growth stage in which you're not quite sure when exactly you hit the peak height velocity. And RISR one usually occurs when peak height velocity has already passed. So it's, it's hard to predict when the peak is uh, using just the wrist sign. So I think generally people have now moved towards a more bone age assessment using a hand and wrist, um, and sometimes with the humerus as well as the femur. Um, so the, probably the two more uh, commonly used uh, methods would be standard staging, which looks at the hand um, in general. And uh, what we do in, use in Hong Kong will be the uh, distal radius and ulnar, which looks at the whole range of growth, looking at when uh, physio capping occurs, which happens at the medial and then the lateral aspects of the uh, radius, as well as the ulnar in which the medial side will uh, cover as well as fuse before the lateral aspect. And uh, this is kind of the grades we want to look at in terms of peak height velocity. All right, so let's move on to practical uses. So how do we use these in day-to-day uh, -day practice? So I think the first thing, to, of course, to note is prognostication. So being able to prognosticate which patients uh, enter peak height velocity, you know when they need to be assessed uh, more frequently and when uh, they have the greatest gains in curve progression. Um, so that, we did this one study looking at um, uh, different maturity parameters, specifically with distal radius and ulnar, looking at when peak growth occurs and growth cessation. So you can see here, it's very similar to that of the, uh, uh, the height gain, um, which you expect to see with the, uh, um, the, the sex hormone release. So you can see a peak height growth uh, with a peak uh, and then followed by growth cessation period at the end. Um, and when we look at the patients who actually have a highest progression risk in terms of whether they have... Uh, uh, curve progression and need of bracing. Uh, so we can see here that this is a summary that we published uh, previously noting that those patients who are generally at the larger curve magnitude to begin with, you generally want to be a bit more aggressive uh, to prevent uh, progression because they are already at that period in which they'll progress quite quickly. Uh, and so even if they are already quite mature, you probably want to be intervening um, uh, then. However, those who are relatively milder at uh, a later age, um, you probably don't need to worry too much about bracing uh, for these patients. Uh, so for in this study, you can see that uh, patients who are 25 degrees in general and baseline have high risk to reach 40 degree threshold. So in these cases, you generally want to brace these patients. This is quite uh, um, the, the usual practice that we would adopt, but you can probably wean them at an earlier phase. Um, at, uh, you know, in DRU, we look at R9, U7. This is when they're already at the, the uh, plateau phase of growth. Uh, but if those cases where the initial cough is quite large, you want to actually uh, be more proactive and give bracing to prevent them to reach the uh, surgical threshold. Now, so how long do you need to actually observe these patients uh, in terms of the peripubertal period? So we looked at these cases in which uh, 
there was uh, coincide the peak growth with the uh, peak pro curve progression rate. And you can see here, this is a patient who you can see with uh, uh, at the peak height velocity, generally speaking, the uh, curve size is relatively well maintained. However, in the following six months, you observe this progression, right? So this peak progression was up to around uh, 12 to 16 degrees um, within six months. So that uh, begs the question, when is the best time you want to brace these patients? Uh, so we looked at um, our data um, over a, a, you know, a decade, uh, looking at the curve progression growth rates. And we kind of charted this plot you can see here, which shows the uh, dotted lines of the growth rate, as well as the mean curve progression rate in the um, full the bold line. You can see actually there's a discrepancy between the two. Uh, this so-called peak curve progression rate occurs after the measured peak height velocity around 90 miles. Uh, that's kind of, kind of important. What's most important to note is a lot of us do look at total body height in our measurements for uh, the peak growth. And the reason why you observe this kind of deviation is because there is a concept of the distal to proximal gradient. So what that means is the lower limbs actually grow at a much earlier time than the uh, spine. And so you will see actually an increase in the total height, body height first, followed by the progression with the spine. So which in the process of looking at this, um, just with the sitting height uh, to see whether that coincides better. All right. So the spine height gain will be more better uh, represented with the sitting height. All right. And then <clears throat> we look at the point at which uh, that cessates, that uh, will be at around 16 months until the growth plateau. And if we, even if we look at those who are uh, relatively more benign in the observation group, as well as more aggressive in the bracing group, similarly, we see, do see this kind of uh, uh, representation. All right, so in general, we, you need to observe these patients uh, for even past peak growth spurt, if you're looking at total body height, uh, up to around nine months uh, yeah, very closely, because these patients may still progress quite significantly, even after that so-called peak height uh, velocity. And how do we often should we follow up? So this is another study we worked with uh, a Japanese group uh, looking at uh, this is radius and ulnar in terms of the cobs. You can see here in general, I think this is quite uh, intuitive. Uh, patients who are uh, around the peak height velocity, just after peak height velocity with a relatively um, mild, mild to moderate curve, you need to observe very closely three months. Uh, once they pass that, you can start uh, gradually increasing your um, uh, intervals of assessment. And once they've reached the plateau phase, you can actually stretch them up to 12 months because the progression rate is actually relatively low in the tens only as compared to the high risk group, which is up to around 80%. For weaning, I think it really depends on what, um, you, what kind of classification or grading scale you use. So there's a various you know, assessment of Sanders and DRU and, and the proxy humerus. In general, what we found that's co quite consistent throughout all our studies is that if patients have large curves, in general, if you're talking about 35 degrees, 40 degrees and onwards, uh, regardless of when you uh, actually wean the brace in terms of those intervals of six to 12 months, these patients would undoubtedly will have some curve progression. Uh, but in general, if you want to look at it, you want to look until the fight will actually uh, starts to fuse before you uh, wean these patients have the best outcome in terms of no progression after brace weaning. Uh, in terms of severe curves, I think there's always a dilemma what you need to do for these cases. And I'm sure um, all my colleagues will be talking about, you know, fusions and or even VBTs for these patients. Uh, but in general, uh, there are a group, you know, of us who would always try to brace these patients, try to maximize uh, conservative management. Uh, natural history dictates that these patients will progress uh, if they're uh, if they're let to be. Um, so you and you don't want to overly uh, prescribe braces because they might uh, still progress and you actually uh, are prolonging the inevitability. Uh, we know for results of these patients that uh, post 40 degrees is unfavorable. Large curves do continue to progress. And there is a problem delaying tactic. This delaying tactic, um, this one study showed that actually if you delay, um, you might actually have increased amount of levels fused. Uh, so you might want to actually uh, operate earlier. However, uh, we, there is some considerations in terms of bracing for these patients. We see in some patients that uh, the response to a bracing really depends on the uh, flexibility. So if you actually have a good, very high flexibility for these patients, they actually 
will be able to tolerate better and actually have a better chance of uh, uh, fit complete treatment with a potential of for curve regression, which we identified to be actually quite frequent in uh, these patients, or if you consider 17% quite frequent, but uh, as a possibility for these patients to actually have curves that regress with brace treatment. And we found that uh, this is up to 17% in our cohort and patients would generally see this kind of thing happening. So you might actually see patients remodeling a curve with uh, brace treatment. And you can see a patient like this who actually have a correction or, uh, to a straight curve uh, up to two years post brace weaning. Uh, so this is kind of my approach, looking at uh, curves who are generally larger, we assess the bone age. Um, if they're around peak height velocity or within nine months after, we can discuss options such as VVT, uh, but you generally want to have close follow-up. If those are beyond nine months of peak height velocity, you probably want to try and encourage bracing first because uh, they might have a chance actually to improve and uh, avoid surgery. Uh, just a final note for VVT, um, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, we'll, we'll hear more about this later, but in general, this is a, a growth modulation technique that actually maintains mobility uh, and uh, is possible for growth modulation. Uh, looking at growth is also very important because it, it helps you kind of determine how much you need to dial in for uh, your surgery to, uh, as you can see here, the amount of growth modulation does depend on their growth um, maturity status. So those are more mature. They don't growth modulate as well. So you probably want to... Uh, dial in more of the uh, tensioning as compared to uh, a smaller uh, Sanders grade. I right, saw so a couple of cases, you can see this is a patient with uh, relatively low Sanders, so only three um, at uh, pre-peak height or at peak height. And you see uh, some growth, growth modulation happening for these patients uh, with time. So 35 down to eight degrees at one year post-op. Uh, Overcorrection will happen if you dial in too much. And in these, you know, Sanders four, if you have a full correction, you actually get some overcorrection uh, appearing. Uh, this is another case of a lumbar curve with uh, young to begin with, uh, very flexible, had a dial in speed straight and uh, developed overcorrection and, and the postoperative one year, which we actually act, had to cut the tether to prevent it from uh, progressing further. So in conclusion, skeletal bone age is most accurate for prediction. Uh, it's very useful for brace initiation when weaning. DRU is actually very well, uh, is very versatile maturity index and curve progression risk is highest just after peak growth spread using total body height assessment. Uh, interval follow-up should coincide with maturity status. Uh, outcomes of weaning depends on the curve size and maturity. Uh, utilizing curve flexibility will help make decisions better, especially in large curves. And uh, bone age is very good guidance for growth modulation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jason. It was a very informative uh, talk. Uh, any questions from our faculties? We can we can have a single question. Uh, can I ask one question, Dr. Jason? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so usually we see a, a scenario where a, 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 an adolescent scoliosis, a patient is beyond uh, 10, 11 years. With uh, not have not attained menarche, but the curve is a major around uh, 70, 80 degree, a big curve. We don't know what to do in such scenario, whether she is going to grow further. We have to look for any other skeletal maturity sign, go for a definitive fusion, or we have to use a brace because it's a big curve. Brace may act, not act. So what you suggest in such scenario, what we have to do, we have to wait or go for a definitive fusion. Oh, well, honestly speaking, um, the dilemma that I mentioned in, in my talk is really those, you know, 40 to 50 degrees. So not at the 70, 80 degrees. I think those are very difficult to be controlled by the brace itself. Even tethering is, is going to be difficult. So a lot of these cases, especially in the thoracic curve, uh, nowadays uh, will we'll go straight for fusion because uh, if you reach 11 to 12 uh, you won't lose actually too much in terms of growth, uh, and you expect these to continue to progress, as you said, pre menarche right? So, um, we will, I would definitely, you know, suggest for fusion in these cases. So, there's a lot of limitations and options at those at that stage. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, I'll invite uh, Dr. Kwan from Malaysia. He, he doesn't know the, need any uh, introduction. Uh, he is speaking on shoulder balance in AI surgery. Please go ahead, sir. And thank you, Dirash. So I'll be talking about shoulder balance in AI surgery. 
introduction. A goal of scoliosis surgery is to correct deformity safely, few shortest for function, and most importantly, a well-balanced spine for cosmeticism. Instructional main thoracic curve, especially length E1, or structural proximal thoracic curve, especially length E2, over correction of main thoracic curve will push the left shoulder upward, and this will result in post-operative shoulder imbalance, also known as PSI. So the pool incident of PSI is approximately 25%, ranges in literature 5% to as high as 60%. PSI patients have been reported to have a poor satisfactory outcome. Types of shoulder imbalance. Uh, nowadays, we, have no, we know that there are different types of shoulder imbalance. Ono and colleagues have reported there are two distinct types of shoulder imbalance. Lateral shoulder imbalance reflected by clavicle angles. Medial shoulder imbalance reflected by trapezius prominence. And colleagues with 3T1 tilt and first rib angles. But if you look at the medial shoulder imbalance, you extend upwards. There is another form of deformity over the neck called neck tilt. So our group have reported that medial shoulder and neck imbalance is associated and correlated significantly with T1 tilt and cervical axis. Lateral shoulder, whereas, is correlated with clavicle angle and RSH as reported by Ordo. So now, in conclusion, we know that shoulder imbalance can be divided into lateral shoulder imbalance, evidenced by clavicle angle and radiological shoulder height. Media shoulder imbalance, evidenced by T1 tilt and first rib angle. And lastly, neck tilt with cervical, evidenced by cervical axis. So, why is the current recommendation for UIV selection? Are these useful? Numerous studies have reported the importance of UIV selection in achieving a good shoulder balance. The following are the algorithms recommended in the literature for main thoracic curve, especially lanky one type and proximal thoracic curve, lanky type 2. However, studies also show that the following recommended UIV selection alone may not be a definitive solution for preventing PSI. Burke and Kariks have reported, despite using the recommended algorithm to, for selecting UIV, they could not identify a set of UIV selection that can accurately predict PSI. And the following have shown that PSI can occur despite appropriate UI selection in T6, T4, and T2. So therefore, besides an appropriate UIV selection, there is, is or are another factor or factors which may contribute to post-op shoulder imbalance. So prevention of medial shoulder and neck imbalance. Is there a solution at this point based on literature? Surprisingly, the answer is yes. We are near to it. Uh, Amir and colleagues have reported that medial shoulder imbalance, evidenced by trapezial prominence, can be prevented by leveling the T1 tilt and first rib angle. We have more proof nowadays that post-operative UIV tilt angle play a very important role in leveling the T1 tilt. Uh, Chance have reported that post-operative UIV tilt angle is an independent factor which correlate with post-operative T1 tilt, which represent the medial shoulder, and post-operative cervical axis, which represent the neck tilt. Then, review 120 lanky 2 AIS patients and reported that 70% actually suffered from medial shoulder imbalance. And the significant predictive factor for medial shoulder uh, imbalance is post-operative UIV tilt angle. So, our group have reported that if the patient have a positive UIV tilt angle til tilted to the right. This patient will have 15 odds times odds of developing medial shoulder imbalance and three times odds of developing uh, neck imbalance. So we know the importance of post-operative UIV tilt angle now, but can we calculate this optimal UIV tilt angle before operation so that we can use this tilt angle intraoperatively to prevent this condition? So um, the answer is that our group has reported that one can use the pre-operative supervised cervical supine side bending firm to calculate this optimal UIV tilt angle before the operation and therefore use this tilt angle to prevent this phenomenon. So this is a supervised 
cervical supine side and infirm by physician. It's going to be the maximum tilt of the neck to the left and to the right. And based on this firm, one can calculate the optimal UIV tilt angle before the operation. Let me show you a clinical case study. This is a lengthy 2AR curve. Main thoracic 65, side bending to 34. Proximal thoracic 37, side bending to 29. In this case, we decided to choose T3 as a UIV instead of T2 for lengthy type 2 uh, curve. So since T3 was selected, we calculate using the supervised vital side bending left and right, and the optimal UIV angle for T3 is negative 5, means that the UIV T3 must be tilted negative 5 to the left. So surgical strategies, as recommended in the literature, you must maximize the correction of proximal thoracic curve in lengthy 2. Harmonious correction of main thoracic curve depends on the amount of proximal thoracic curve correction. And unify both main thoracic and proximal thoracic into single thoracic curve if possible. So this is before correction. After the screw incision, UIV tube angle is plus 5 to the right. After correction maneuver, UIV tube is corrected to negative 5 to the left. So more importantly is that the UIV tube angle can be assessed intraoperatively before the procedure, during and after performing the correction maneuver by visualizing the UIV tube directly clinically. And this tube angle can be confirmed by using the intraoperative crossbar with the help of the fluoroscopy. So with the crossbar and fluoroscopy, UIV tube angle is measured and T1 tube is confirmed. So therefore, pre-operative, post-operative 18 months, as you can see, the UIV T3 tube is still to the negative zone. And so therefore, we are able to get a good neck and medial shoulder balance and avoiding this disaster. How about prevention of lateral shoulder imbalance? At this point, based on literature, there's no solution yet. What we know is 20% of normal adolescents have asymmetrical lateral shoulder. Levering of T1 does not guarantee lateral shoulder balance. And even you end up with T2 does not guarantee post-op lateral shoulder balance. That means obviously, there's no one can manipulate, manipulate the spine and hope to control the lateral shoulder, which is far away from the spine. Then what we know from about lateral shoulder balance, we know lateral shoulder balance will improve significantly from immediate post-op to six months after surgery. More importantly, 90% of patients will regain lateral shoulder at the end of three years follow-up. Distal adding on may be a form of compensatory mechanism for lateral shoulder imbalance. Conclusion. So now we know shoulder imbalance can be divided into lateral shoulder imbalance, medial shoulder imbalance with a component of neck tilt. For lateral shoulder imbalance, spontaneous correction can occur during follow-up. Distal adding on might be a form of compensatory mechanism. For major shoulder imbalance with neck tilt, UIV selection is important, but besides UIV selection, an optimal UIV tilt angle is important in order for us to level the T1 tilt. And surgical strategies must be tailored to achieve, achieve the planned U, optimal UIV tilt angle and indirectly leveling the T1 tube. Hopefully, we can avoid this problem. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. It was, uh, wow, a wonderful uh, uh, talk on a very uh, com complex uh, topic. You have extremely presented and made it uh, simple to understand for everybody. Any thank you, thank you. for Dr. Kwan? Diraj, I have one question for Dr. Kwan. Uh, very excellent talk and informative. A uh, lot of us uh, use hooks for a soft landing the uh, at the UIV. Do you find any difference with the hooks, transfer TP hooks uh, versus a screw in achieving a shoulder balance? Because the way the they say it's more of a distraction that should be used for a, getting a UIV horizontalized. So what is your take on a hooks versus a screw uh, with respect to the shoulder balance in a UIV? Um, okay, uh, thank you. This is a Excellent uh, uh, question, uh, uh, First is that uh, putting a hook um, to create a soft landing uh, 
is a myth. Uh, the reason being that uh, you can put the screws and yet can create a soft landing. So you just need to make sure that the proximal rod contouring angle are properly being done. Uh, rod contouring angle is RCA. Uh, RCA has been, uh, uh, been published by uh, Rona in his article to prevent BTJK in lengthy type 2. So it means that your curve proximal side must be overbent to make sure when the screw before the URV screw, all right, when you compress the nut to the screws, the most proximal UI screw already sitting on the UIV screws. So in that sense, in that case, in, the, in that situation, your proximal, your UIV screw will be soft landing as well. So uh, with regard to the sec uh, second part, which is that uh, using hook can create soft landing. Uh, obviously true, using hook uh, can create soft landing too. But I personally feel that uh, you should not use a proximal hook onto the right convex side of the main thoracic. Because if you use a hook on the convex side on the main thoracic, over the T3 or T2 region, you will pull the right shoulder downward and this will further aggravate the left shoulder upward in lanky two case. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, my question to you, uh, since this is a cosmetic prominence, do you make an attempt to assess this uh, on table uh, in prone position, how much it is get, getting corrected uh, uh, by a visual uh, eyeballing also? And how how uh, how much efforts you make on table uh, to correct that uh, cosmetic correction and how high you go, uh, maximum what? You have done till now. Have you gone up to T two or beyond that T one or sometimes? Oh, thank you. I I got your I got your question. I think that's a very 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 question. Um, at this point, I think the conventional recommendation of UIV selection is correct. Uh, what uh we have missed so far is the tilt angle. So as I mentioned earlier, if you stop at T three, and you park your T three to the positive zone. You have 15 odd of medial shoulder imbalance and three times odds of having neck tilt. So, because of, of that, nowadays we routinely perform a supervised survival side bending firm to measure the best UIV tilt angle, favorable or we call optimal UIV tilt angle. Let's say the optimal UIV tilt angle T3 is negative 5. So, during the surgery, we will look at the, U, the T3 vertebra by looking at the screws and to make sure that the tilt angle is tilted to the negative side while we are performing all the correction maneuver. So one is by direct visualization and second is you can counter check by putting a crossbar and confirm using a fluoroscopy. All right, that the tilt angle is within your favorable zone the best is in the optimal zone so that your T1 tilt will be at a, a flat position. Fine. Yeah. yeah. May I, Krishna? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, okay. I was going to say, uh, Dr. Dr. Wong has had his hand up for a while, so maybe we'll ask Dr. Wong to ask the question. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, Guan. Um, the talk is a very excellent talk. Um, for patients with high risk of medial shoulder balance, especially for those patients with a very tilted T1, why don't we um, regularly go to T1, fix to T1? Then we can also make use of T1 to uh, mobility to make T1 more horizontal. And normally T1, the pedicle are bigger than other level and easier to put the screw. So what was your will in this point? Uh, uh, thank you, Yeva. Uh, Yeva always put out a very excellent question because he's just too experienced. He just spotted one of my error during SRS uh, meeting. Okay. Um, uh, Horizontalize of the T1 is only feasible when the patient do not have cervical scoliosis. So what we're talking at this point is an idiopathic scoliosis without cervical scoliosis. Uh, in the event that the patient have a very severe lengthy tool, 
Um, do we routinely go to T1 to correct the T1 tilt, which is easier? Yes, going to T1 have been uh have been well uh uh, uh proposed by Professor Sook in his uh, publication in 2000. Uh, he instead saying that all Lenki two should go to T1 in order to control the proximal thoracic curve. But in our institution, we found out that we rarely need to go to T1 for a few reasons. First, in order to go to T1, you need to dissect up to expose the C7 spinous process. And occasionally, you will need to expose C6 spinous process. Uh, two, uh, putting C1 screw, T1 screw, and T2 screw, T1 screw will subject yourself all right, meddling with the nerve, all right, to the brachial plexus. Uh, three is that um, even though T1 uh, uh, you have a bigger uh, uh, pedicle, all right, but most of the time we do not need to go to T1 because T2 as well have a very big and good pedicle for us to put screw. And on top of that, the T2 angulation usually is very high and that will provide us a very strong screw. So to answer the question is that we usually do not go to T1. Despite a patient having a severe lengthy type 2, we will stop at T2. But we will make sure that the T2 tip angle is being calculated before operation and achievable during operation by performing the standard maneuver. Thank you. Uh, may I question? Yeah, thank you for your excellent lecture. So. Uh, I usually use the uh, check the C arm before the uh, closing of the wound for final uh, shoulder balancing. But I what I found was that the C arm view is not always uh, reflecting the real situation of shoulder balancing in actuality. So, what's your experience for that? Yeah, thanks, Professor. So, um. C arm is not a good um, indicator for lateral shoulder balance. But in our experience, for medial shoulder imbalance and neck tilt, uh, C arm with a crossbar is a very useful method. Mm. Uh, instead that we have published this paper uh, to look into the reliability, you know, and uh, accuracy of using this crossbar in measuring the UIV tilt and T1 tilt. And this has been published. Yeah. Thank you for your excellent question. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. Uh, it was You're welcome. Extremely, yeah. Extremely important topic. Hence, everybody took a chance to ask a question to you directly. I will move on to our, uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Kota Watanabe from Japan. He'll be speaking on LIV selection in AI surgeries. Over to you, Dr. Kwan, uh, Watanabe. So my name is Kota Watanabe from Keio University, Tokyo, Japan. So thank you very much for having me uh, to ASI APSS Global Outreach Session. So my talk is about LIV selection in AI surgery. Here's my disclosure. There are two conflicting goals in deciding the future area for spinal deformity. Longer is better from the standpoint of correction of deformity, while shorter is better from the standpoint of reservation of mobile segments, especially when we consider spine fusion in lumbar spine. Thus, we need to consider to minimize the fusion area while maintaining spinal balance. So here's a, a radiographic complication for the uh, AIS patient. We need a posterior surgery, shoulder imbalance, distal adding on, proximal adding on, decompensation, and the PJK or DJK. Among them, I'm going to discuss about the distal adding on, decompensation, and the distal junction of kyphosis, all of uh, which are related to the selection of LIV. So here's the important words you need to know. And vertebra is defined as the most tilted vertebra in the curve. Neutral vertebra is defined as a no or less rotated vertebra. Stable vertebra is defined as most cranial vertebra. 
divided by CS, a VL center of the group vertical line, and last touching vertebra is defined as most cranial vertebra touched by CS, VL. Post operative distal adding on is extension of curve beyond LIV after the surgery. It is defined as 5 mm lateral deviation at LIV plus 1 or disc wedging of 5 degrees or more at distal disc of LIV. The occurrence rate is reported from 2 to 51%, and the long term consequences of PDA is still not still fully understood. And the spontaneous, spontaneous improvement can be expected in some portion of a uh, patient in lumbar, with a uh, lumbar modifier type B or C. Also, revision surgery is rarely required. Here is the risk factor of uh, postoperative post disc adding in lumbar modifier A. Uh, there are the smaller risk grade type 1A or and the position of lower instrument in vertebra. So where the LIV should be to prevent postoperative dislodging in lumbar modifier A? There's many many reports about how to prevent the this postoperative dislodging on, but the uh, the formula they reported is sometimes very confusing and sometimes very uh, complicated. So we focus on the last touching vertebra, which is defined as a last cranial vertebra touching CSVL. So we did a study about the uh, distal adingo in link type 1 air, and they found that the, this factor of distal adingo was a post-operative apical vertebral transplantation of 25 mm or uh, last uh, LIB shorter than the last touching vertebra. So our preventive method is uh, select LIB at as touching vertebra or distal and uh, minimize apical translation as much as possible. So here's a 16-year-old girl with uh, AS link type 1C. Major thrust curve angle was uh, 64 degree and uh, circle lumbar curve was 44 degrees. And then on bending, circle lumbar curve was decreased to uh, 19 degrees. So that because we assign this curve type as ARS uh, Renke type 1C. So we did the surgery and the fusion area was from T5 to T11. And then, as you can see on the slide, uh, post at uh, the post operative one, uh, post one week X ray show a little bit decompensation, and then at the post of one year, the, the decompensation uh, further uh, increased, deteriorated. So that because at the, we did the revision surgery for her, extending the fusion area uh, from T2 to L3 for this patient. So, postoperative decompensation is defined as a postoperative trunk imbalance, and uh, the occurrence rate is reported from 6 to 20 percent, and uh, this factor is also reported to be the LIV distal and last touching vertebra and the lumbar modifier of type B and C. In some patients, we can expect it also the spontaneous uh, recovery within two years, but the, the reality is not that not that good, I think. So the prevention will be select LIB at rest touching vertebra or include circle lumbar curve into the fusion area. I always feel dilemma when I consider LIV in lumbar modifier type B and type C. If LIV was longer, the risk of decompensation increase and postoperative L4 tilt increase. While if LIV was shorter, the risk of postoperative adding on increase but L4 tilt may improve in this case. If stroke lumbar curve was included into fusion earlier, L4 tilt also improved but they lose uh, lumbar mobility. So we need a long-term research to determine which has more advantage for this patient. 
So here's another case, 15-year-old girl with Risto 4 AIS. Uh, the main uh, thrust curve was 64 degrees and the uh, uh, proximal curve angle was 60, 40, also 64 degrees and it was all bended only to 44 degrees. Lumbar curve was 33, but it was bended back to 19 degrees on side bending. So, uh, so I, I decided, I assigned this was a uh, length type 2A and then I decide the fusion area from T to T troll. So here's a possible x-ray. So the patient uh, developed the distal junction of kyphosis as you can see on the slide. And then when I look back to the, the x-ray before surgery, as you can see, the patient has a 59 degree of thoracic kyphosis. So the DJK developed as further deteriorated after the surgery, as we, the patient is required to uh, revision surgery for the PTK for DJK. So DJK distal junction kyphosis was defined as a possibility kyphotic change at LIV and below, and then distal junction angle of more than 10 degrees. The occurrence rate was reported to be 0.2% to 15%. So here's the uh, prevention method for the distal junction kyphosis. So select LIB at end vertebra, in this case L1, and then uh, some, some also reported that the first row dotic vertebra, it is uh, L2 in this case, and uh, the other uh, the other choice will be the sagittal stable vertebra, in this case uh, L3. But I prefer to uh, select our first row dotic vertebra in my experience. So here's a summary of my talk. Uh, my preference for L by V sections are uh, my first include distal and vertebra into the fusion area and then extend it to last touching vertebra. And uh, when I look at the uh, sagittal profile, we extended it to the, when the patient have a uh, hyperkyphosis, we I ex extended it into the first row of the vertebra. Thank you so much. Thank you, Koda. Uh, are you are you here? I think uh, he's not here. He's not here. Okay. All right. Oh, that's too bad. Then, if that's the case, maybe we'll go straight into the case discussion. Uh, Dirash, you will be presenting the first case. Uh, Diraj, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Am I visible now? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, it was visible before. You were just muted. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, APSS SI, for this opportunity. So I will be presenting a, a case, a simple case of adolescent idiopathic, uh, idiopathic scoliosis. So she was a 16 years old girl uh, with uh, a menage two years before, and it has uh, she presented with a progressive uh, curve with the right sided uh, uh, rib hump and uh, right hip prominence. C7 was uh, centered. So these are the clinical uh, findings. She had uh, shoulder imbalance, hip imbalance, and uh, rib hump of uh, 20 degree. Yeah, so this was uh, a lankave type 4C N curve. There was some hypokyphosis. So this was a triple uh, uh, curve. Yeah, so the obvious plan for us was uh, a T2 to uh, L4 posterior instrumentation and correction with multiple level pontes uh, at the uh, convex side. 
and we have proceeded with the same plan. There was some uh, interoperative issues. Uh, uh, everything gone smooth uh, till all screws were in. All screws were checked. Uh, uh, we check uh, as a routine uh, uh, technique. Uh, we check the pedicle track. We stimulate the uh, pedicle track with uh, the trigger uh, probe uh, and uh, as well as the filler, obviously. And uh, and that's how we inserted most of our screws. Uh, all screws were in. Uh, first uh, concave rod uh, uh, was uh, inserted with a cantilever technique. It was a cobalt chromium rod. And second rod was also gone in. And after few minutes of second rod was in, uh, there was a, a signal drop on the left side, which was the uh, uh, concave side. And suddenly, right, uh, right side also started dropping uh, to 40% uh, of the baseline. Uh, so I don't know what happened. Uh, yeah, so anybody wants to uh, comment at this stage, what could have gone wrong in a in a juicy AIS uh, curve? Anyway, yes, yes, Dr. Kwan. Um, yes, uh, usually during correction and in the drop of uh, the neural monitoring, I think first thing is to consider is the screw placement. Yeah, because as you derotate, if the screw is media, then that will be the culprit that's going to cause the, the deterioration of the neural monitoring signal. Right. So that's the first suspect. Yeah, that is one thing. Anything else you suspect? Uh, uh, apart from the screw placement that caused the uh, tensioning. Can we say that we want to talk? Yes, Dr. Shajan, please. Are you asking me? Yes, yes, you can also comment, sir, please. Okay, uh, Dheeraj, yeah. first things first. When you put a patient with a right side primary curve, always put the slides the other side. So the right side should be on the right side. Otherwise, it creates confusion. That yeah. is one. Thank and you. this is, uh, I think, like a double curve. So you're, when you were talking about the concave side, you were perhaps uh, referring to the thoracic curve. Yes, yes. Main major thoracic, sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but as you see, it's the classical double curve. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, when you say the concave side then you don't know whether you're referring to the lumbar or the thoracic it was a major curve sir which i am referring to the major thoracic sir. okay all right uh as far as i am concerned if uh, there is a drop in potentials and we do it always at every screw and uh, if the, at a particular screw draw uh, placement the drop is there that screw comes out that's a, that's the simple. So all screws were in. We have checked uh, all screws under neuromonitoring uh, trigger as well as we triggered the screw as well. Neuromonitoring was checked uh, at multiple levels. First rod was in. Uh, there was it was absolutely okay. Second rod was in. It was absolutely okay. Then after a few minutes, it dropped suddenly. So needless to say, you would have instituted all the measures, bringing the blood pressure yes, up, obviously, right, and sir. all that. Yes, yeah, we have improved the BP and uh, you went line. Yeah, everything we have done for and for whatever it is worth, maybe given steroids as well. Yes, obviously, <clears throat> but so, it did not pick up. It doesn't pick up. So what? What? What are the steps usually we like to do? Yes, Doctor Wong. Uh... Uh before Dr. Wong asks, I just want to jump in there. Actually, um, yeah. that's very interesting. Um, with an MEP drop, you will immediately give steroids to this patient? Is that, uh, is that is what I just want to understand the uh, rationale and the, you know, the, your usual practice. Yeah, so usual practice, uh, uh, usually we assess all the screws at every step uh, and we go as per the level. So, uh, and we trigger the track as well as the screw, as I have told you. So we are, or most of the time, we are sure that screw is not the issue. Yeah, I, I, I understand, yeah. but yeah. Um, so you, if, you if it doesn't go, then steroid is not the first thing we like to do. We try to increase the BP, put the warm patient on warm saline. If nothing goes uh, better, then we we I don't go for MPS immediately. I go put a ask the anesthetist to give a DEXA shot. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, because I, yeah. I suppose there's a lot of other uh, possible reasons for the uh, the drop that uh, you yeah. can also always check as right. well. You've done Ponty, you've done rot, rot right. correction. There's a lot of reasons. But anyway, yeah. um, maybe Dr. Wong can uh, ask his question first. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, and, and, so, and other um, 
um, people said there are many causes of drop in MEP. Um, school placement is one, and, yeah. and I also encounter cases, um, even with you know, monitoring uh, insertion of the school, even next way so that the school um, were all in good position. Sometimes um, a very medial, a very mild medial preparation of school, especially on the concave side of the curve, can cause the problem. And, mm. and drop in blood pressure, and even after the um, uh, pontic osteotomy, there may be possibility of hematoma, epidural hematoma that compression on the core. It's right. very difficult immediately for people um, knowing um, where is the culprit. So I, right. I, in my opinion, I think the most important thing is um, a strategic and systemic uh, approach how to deal with the problem. So obviously we need to stop the procedures. We ask the anesthetist to, um, even the pressure did not drop to a very low level, we, we want to increase the blood pressure. Um, we sometimes give uh, uh, water, we check the x-ray for school position, and, and, um, and, and obviously we will release, if necessary, uh, try to release the uh, correction of the uh, deformity uh, and, and see whether there's any reverse of the, um, the, the, the signal. Um, and, and in case, if the signal does not um, return, um, the surgeon may need to determine whether they uh, would like to abandon the surgery uh, and, and work up the patient first. So uh, I, I probably will emphasize more on the overall systemic approach rather than and guessing uh, what, is the, uh, what, what, what is the reason for, <laughs> for, for the job in the MEP. And, and that is yeah. my opinion. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, do you, yeah. My yeah, experience, soon. yeah, my experience is that the uh, 80 degree of curvature correction rarely, very rarely causes yes. a, a MEP drop during the. Yes, that's the unusual maybe. scenario. That's what I'm presenting. Yeah. Yeah. So the maybe the possible cause of uh, drop of MEP is the malpositioning or mildly the uh, violating the medially by the spot the. The screw screw violating screw. the medial wall. Opening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then okay. maybe the cause. So. Yeah, got it, sir. Yeah, okay. uh, Diraj, it's not during uh, insertion of screw. It's uh, during correction right. that the screw okay. actually cut in. Yeah, it's so, not insertion. Insertion yeah. is perfect. It's uh, during the maneuver. Yeah, got it, sir. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. so uh, yeah, Diraj, maybe you move on to. Yeah, yeah, what? I'm moving on. That's all. So, uh, uh, we have we are we have reversed that uh, procedure. We have taken out the rod initially, and uh, yeah. So we, I and Dr. Tushar were uh, doing this as a live surgery demonstration. Uh, there was some Sri Lankan delegates who came for uh, observing us. And uh, this was during a live surgery. So uh, we, uh, we decided to take off uh, both the rods. Uh, uh, so and uh, the signal started uh, returning to normal. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, uh, so I have experienced such thing uh, before also in my practice. Uh, so in that case, I have applied the same thing here as well. So I've gone with a convex rod with a slightly contoured uh, rod and a titanium rod. Previously, it was a cobalt chrome. This time I shifted to titanium, slightly flexible and softer rod and slightly contoured rod. So uh, first rod was in, second rod was in. We waited for, we started, we got and everything was normal. Uh, and we started, we proceeded with the decortication and uh, bone graft uh, was laid over. And uh, again, when, when the closure was started, again, there was a drop uh, at 45 minutes. So by 30 minutes, we have observed by going ahead with the procedure. And again, at 45 minutes, again, there was a drop on left side and right side also, there was a, a, a almost 40% of drop. Uh, there was a gel foam uh, we kept as a for a hemostasis uh, at the uh, pontase level. So Tushar suggested that might be the compressing component and we suggested to take out that uh, as well. So we have taken out, we have done all the measures as we do uh, last time apart and we try to increase uh, the BP everything. We have not taken out the uh, inch, uh, rods yet. So what might be the uh, uh, cause again, you I feel the same thing has happened again or... Uh, Yes, Dr. Kwan, uh, somebody wants to comment right now. Yeah. You still feel the medial screws uh, is the cause or something else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, in this situation, uh, the first culprit will be the screws. 
Yeah. Uh, correction wise, you know, as what uh, Professor So and Professor, uh, Dr. Sargent have said, uh, these are the pretty uh, uh, straightforward curve that we correct every day. Yeah. Uh, you have to, if you have a pre op MRI, you should be looked again uh, to look at the uh, you know, the uh, type of cord that we are dealing with, uh, with. And that may give you some clue uh, uh, whether you know, there's any issue with the correction. Um, yeah, that's my comment. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this time, uh, again, we so we have taken off the gel foam as I have told you. We have kept the rod as it is, and we have stabilized the BP. We have raised the BP, uh, given again a shot of uh, 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 Dexa, and put a warm saline and waited for some time. And uh, yeah, to our surprise, everything came back to uh, normal. It started improving, and within uh, fifteen minutes, uh, bilateral uh, the neuro signals was back to normal. Uh, so one of the suspicious here was the gel foam, what Tushar has uh, uh, suggested uh, to take off the gel foam, which might be the compressing component, or we don't know the uh, softer titanium contour rod has uh, uh, helped us. So we don't know and everything was normal and uh, uh, this was uh, uh, this was a correction at the end. Uh, we have got a decent correction in both the planes. Yeah, and this was the clinical profile of this patient. Thank you. Thanks, Deeraj, for a uh, for great discussion case. Um, let's let's move on to the second. Uh, Chikit, you want to present your case? Yeah, thank you. I'll share your screen. Okay, so um, thank you uh, very much, ASSI and APSS, for inviting me to present this case. I can't advance. Ah, okay. So this is a 13 years old girl with thoracic scoliosis, uh, generally has normal birth and developmental history, achieved Menaki at 12 years old. Uh, this is the clinical picture of her. Um, she has a BMI of 25, tenor is 2, uh, normal neurological examination, no neurocutaneous stigmata, Baton score is 0. This is her x-rays. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we also put x-rays uh, with main thoracic on the left side. <laughs> so uh, this is our common presentation uh, method. Yeah. So she has a main thoracic curve of 93, uh, which uh, bend to 61 with a flexibility of 34%. Uh, upper thoracic uh, also is stiff. And uh, however, the lumbar 57 uh, bent to 20 with a flexibility of 64. So this one is a lanky 2, uh, but type C, uh, type, uh, lanky 2C type of curve. So if we uh, look at the rotation, you can see here uh, thoracic is 30, lumbar is 15 with a ratio of 2.2. .2. Uh, the AV, we have calculated also the AVT, 75 for thoracic 23, lumbar, the ratio 3.2. Uh, she does not have a uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis and the lumbar apex Nashmo uh, value is two. So this is a patient with uh, adolescent idiopathic sclerosis, lanky 2CN. So uh, I would like to ask the panel, what is your proposed plan for this patient? Uh, anyone who want to comment? We, uh, we asked uh, Prof Wong first. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, are you asking me? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think there are uh, two uh, strategy. One is we do a selective forensic fusion, but we undercorrect the forensic curve a bit. Um, I expected that because the number curve is feasible and um, after correction of the forensic curve, it may unbend itself. But if we correct the for main forensic curve too much, um, 
the patient may have decompensation to other side. So I think that is the first strategy. I think it's still um, feasible in this case because uh, the number curve is feasible. And if we um, have the corpse angle ratio of the thoracic and, 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 and the uh, lumbar curve, they are still uh, better than uh, 1.2 um, in ratio. Um, a, a, a second uh, um, more sure wing um, strategy is to fuse both curves, then um, we probably can get a better looking X-ray, uh, but we need to fuse long. So um, I probably would discuss with the family and see which strategy they accept. Um, and obviously, if we do a uh, selective thoracic fusion, uh, there may be a possibility of lumbar deterioration. The patient may need uh, a period of bracing, and the worst will be a second operation to extend the fusion to um, include the um, lumbar curve. Uh, that is my opinion. Thank you very much, uh, Jason. It, that was actually I was hoping to ask Koda that when he but then uh, he, he was he isn't here because the the C type curve is always a dilemma. Um, there is some suggestion of uh, I always think of these when you go into the lumbar curve and then you try to do some uh, you know what Peter Newton calls it you know uh, counter torsion or de rotation to the opposite side that might help to uh, de contour the uh, lumbar curve a bit more. Uh, whether that's the case or not, of course, you know that's it's very controversial. We need more data uh, to to understand it. But at least some of the cases I tried to do that uh, seems to work. Um, so uh, maybe we'll ask uh, Dr. Professor Su if you have uh, other comments on your plan for this patient. Yeah. So so if I do, my fusion level will be from T two L four. So. Because there are many the rotation in L, the lumbar curve, so uh, I would like to prefer L four going down. One, two, three, four. Yeah, from T two L four. Yeah. Will you you won't consider uh, not fusing lumbar for this patient? No, no fusing. Uh, going down we'll, to L four. We'll, yes, uh, as. Yeah, Dr. Wong mentioned uh, not to fuse the lumbar curve. What we, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, you can, but the, there's there gonna be some residual curvature in lumbar and later causing on a adding on or decompensation. So I would prefer going down to L four. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, to pro uh, Professor Wong and Professor Su. Yeah, what is the, because there are so many uh, parameters here that we look at, what is the important parameters for you to decide whether you want to do selective or non-selective? Uh, what are the important parameters that you look at? Um, Maybe Professor Wong first, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Chiki. Um, it's very difficult to answer. As you mentioned, there are many parameters um, for assessment. Um, I don't think there is any single parameter uh, we can tell for sure. Uh, I normally will consider all the factors, including the corpse magnitude, the degree of rotation, clinically how severe is the harm, the uh, maturity, um, the main curve and uh, minor curve where you show, um, taking all factors into consideration uh, rather than a single um, so-called most uh, significant factor. So um, I, I have to say, um, if we do a selective thoracic fusion in this case, uh, we take the risk of decompensation and may need a future surgery. But uh, since we can avoid, we have the possibility of avoiding uh, fusion of, of um, the most of the numbers that month. So it's still worthwhile to bring this point for discussion with the family. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in my view, the when the uh, curvature is big like this, the when the curvature it gets uh, corrected, uh, the shoulder imbal imbalance will develop because here just some fifty one degree of curvature. So if there's a, a large curve more than thirty or forty, then we go up to T two or T three for the correction of a, a proximal thoracic curvature, and the second for lumbar curve. 
uh, rotation is very severe, like see here. So when there are severe lumbar rotation with some curve, then we go down to uh, stable vertebra, like a neutral, or uh, that's why we are going down to L4. Uh, thank you. I, yeah. I agree with the um, lumbar rotation is quite significant here. And out of these three parameters, the translation, rotation, and the curve at uh, magnitude, the most important parameter which study shows is the translation, apical vertebral translation, which gives a uh, very important in that. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Jason, Dr. Sajan, Sajan, go ahead. Yeah. Of course, I am going to be speaking on uh, the new technique of non-fusion. And uh, though I have not done it, uh, I have seen some colleagues who address the thoracic, in this case, which is significant, uh, with posterior spinal instrumentation, but non-fusion for the lumbar cuff. Uh, it has been done in Turkey. I yeah. know uh, that Dr. Baron Lorna and uh, the Randy Betts group have also been doing what they call as a hybrid. Uh, otherwise, you're looking at fusing this child's spine from T1 or T2 to almost L4. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not let me, me have a comment. Yeah, I do. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for the uh, yeah. presentation. Looking at the curve itself, the main curve seems to be at the main thoracic area. The shoulder itself, the tilt is on the right side. Uh, and the shoulder high on the right side as well on the radiological uh, x-rays. So in my mind, the, the main curve is the main thoracic. And in my hands, I, I would consider to do a anterior release followed by traction. In that way, I can assess the flexibility of the lumbar curve. And sometimes in the traction view, you were able to make a decision on whether you can skip doing lumbar uh, uh, all together and in this case uh, in fact if the uh, proximal thoracic is reacting uh, appropriately uh, and reduces uh, retractions I, I may just do from T3 to uh, covering the mean thoracic but of course when I do a posterior stage I'll do a ponte uh, to get adequate release also bearing in mind to match the curve uh, between the mean thoracic and proximal thoracic such that the uh, left shoulder is not high afterwards so I will be uh, proposing a stage procedure, anterior, release, tractions, uh, then go to the back. Right, right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Dr. Jason, just one comment from me. Uh, in this case, I will make an attempt to uh, uh, preserve the lumbar motion and avoid going uh, up to L4. Uh, while positioning uh, when patient is under uh, muscle relax and, and anesthesia, I will again assess the lumbar correction uh, flexibility and uh, rotation. And uh, then I will uh, uh, see uh, uh, my uh, CSVL. If it's going up to, uh, with L1, L2 uh, and with a decent uh, correction of uh, lumbar curve and good correction of the lumbar uh, rotation as well, I may go up to L1 uh, or around that. Yeah. Great. Uh, Cheek is excellent for putting out a, a good case for you know, five or six different techniques. <laughs> please, please proceed. Uh -huh. So uh, we try to counsel patient and they agreed for selective thoracic fusion. Um, so uh, just the parameters that I want to highlight uh, that we have looked through and all these parameters has been published before uh, different um, authors have uh, uh, given their different opinions. Like uh, these matches, uh, our cop is too big. They don't agree with selective thoracic fusion. Lanky, all parameters agree, but one doesn't agree because we have a borderline kyphosis. Much agrees. Uh, Shu doesn't agree. And as you can see that even in this uh, literature, they have different opinion on selective thoracic fusion. So our plan is uh, to uh, do fusion from T2 to L1. Uh, we perform radical facetectomy 
uh, is a smaller form of SPO or quantity. And we plan for three rods. So this is our uh, post-op radiographs. Um, we managed to reduce the lumbar curve to 40 degree and the thoracic curve to 48 degree. And our follow-up at eight months, uh, the lumbar curve maintained at about 38 to 40 degrees and the mean thoracic remained. Yeah, um, any comments on uh, what we have done? No, when? Yeah, Chikit, how do you uh, manage your shoulder balance in this situation? Uh, yes, so we have, uh, as uh, what Prof Kwan has uh, described just now, we have a technique to measure a uh, uh, UIV tilt. So, so we just make sure that uh, our tilt intraoperatively to the CSL line that we use a crossbar, we use a crossbar intraoperatively, uh, is matching the calculated tilt. So we, we raise this tilt by uh, looking at the supine side bending. Yeah. Oh. Yes, so perhaps we'll ask uh, Dr. Hegde and uh, Prof. Su to comment because they're the two who con consider long fusions. What do you think? I think uh, uh, the surgeon has done an excellent job, but I just have a query. So you put that short rod on the concave side first, and distract to get the correction in the extreme uh, uh, part of the deformity first, and then add the rest of the construct. How do you go about it? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, we we put this to perform some correction, but uh, generally in our center, we will start with the right side rod in first. Okay. Then we will put this short rod, and then the the left side rod. And if you can see, this is uh, not a connector. This is a double head screw. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, any particular reason for that particular short rod? How it, how it works? Any advantage? Yeah, there are several advantages. Uh, one is it's easier to rot in the left-sided rod as uh, the correction of the thoracic. Uh, we are worried that if we overcorrect the thoracic, we may have shoulder imbalance and we cannot get a good tilt uh, for the lumbar, and we may have uh, overcorrection. So therefore, uh, uh, that is one. And second is uh, we can have more control over the concave correction. Great job, Hikin. Um, I, I think we're, we're quite far behind schedule, so let's move on to the... the uh... Four, five, six. So, um, uh, maybe I have Dr. Wong to talk about the role of anterior surgery in AIS. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, do you see my slide? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, now in the era before the powerful posterior multi-segmental instrumentation um, and various form of osteotomy, anterior correction of scoliosis, uh, either along or in combination with posterior surgery, were uh, regularly done to correct uh, severe rigid scoliosis. Um, in modern scoliosis correction, some surgeons attempt to use boracoscopic uh, correction of the deformity um, in order to reduce the surgical trauma. But this technique is not very popular because of the clinical difficulty and the steep learning curve. However, um, the recent attention to the vertebral body testing revitalized the technique. Um, in my opinion, for vector correction of um, scoliosis, um, I think the main application of anterior surgery is for lanky five and lanky six curves. Many of us have reported that anterior correction and fusion can save motion segments. Um, apart from shorter fusion, um, it is very powerful to correct the deformity. 
especially for more rigid scoliosis. Um, and there is no injury to the paraspinal muscles and the butt loss is usually minimal. Compared to um, posterior surgery, um, it may have a higher chance of pulmonary complications or potentially it may injure uh, some visceral organ. Um, but for posterior surgery, sometimes uh, the pedicles um, may be dysplastic and small and putting in pedicle school may be difficult. Now, technically, anterior correction is um, not very difficult. We normally put the patient in a lateral position with Conway's side up. Um, the incision is along one of the ribs, and for, for a columbar curve, usually the incision is along the 10th rib. After mobilizing the peritoneum uh, medially and go into the pleural cavity, we can cut the diaphragm radially um, with about one centimeter uh, ring for subsequent repair. Um, the segmental vessels were negated because it, they are in the exact position of the school insertion. Then uh, multiple discectomy can be done. Um, and the landmark is to expose the posterior longitudinal ligament. And the, the location of the PLL can serve as um, a landmark for the school direction. Um, and also removal of all the discs reduce the chance of uh, this bulging into the spinal canal during the collection. Um, then we insert uh, um, fixed head screw into the vertebral body. Um, the correction of the scoliosis is by translating the vertebral body towards uh, the wrong. And the alignment, especially the sagittal alignment, um, is mainly dictated by the bending of the rock. Um, and, and because of that, um, the chance of having kyphosis is much less um, compared to the old day. Um, I've reviewed 71 cases uh, we did um, in the past. The FH age was um, 15 years old, age as surgery, minimal two years follow up. We use single rock system and whip autograph for the anterior fusion. Um, about 40% of the cases we uh, fuse from end to end. And another 60% of cases we can fuse shorter than end to end. The FH correction rate was nearly 90%. Um, this is the example to show how we save the postmodal and the distal motion segment. Um, this patient had T9 to L2. Um, scoliosis of about 56 uh, degree. And if we did posterior surgery, I think most of you may agree we need to fuse from T9 to L2, if not L3. Um, however, for anterior fusion, um, we can fuse um, from T10 to L1. Um, although the overall curvature, the residual curve is 19 degree, um, but I think without trunk decompensation, a residual curve of 19 degree um, is acceptable. And the trade-off is we can save more motion sand. Um, this table shows the distribution of uh, saving of the motion segment. Um, as mentioned before, about 40% of cases we can fuse from end to end vertical. 14% um, we save one distal motion segment. 30% save one possible motion uh, segment. 14% save one distal and one possible uh, vertebral motion segment. And um, I think saving the distal lumbar motion segment is more important because it's safe uh, motion. Um, and from our result, 30% um, of cases, we can save the distal motion segment and no patient we need to fuse more than end-to-end -end vertebral. Um, comparing to fusion from end-to-end, -end, a shorter fusion, um, we will have less percentage correction. That means the patient may have a more severe residual curve. But on average, the residual curve less than 15%, um, I think the result is acceptable. Um, columnal decompensation is defined as discrepancy between the columnal vertical uh, SL axis and the central safe line, uh, more than 20 millimeter. Before the surgery, 28 cases um, have significant coronal decompensation. 
after the surgery, four patients had marginal decompensation, and one patient, the decompensation was due to the deterioration of the forensic curve. Um, there was um, the uh, dist distal to LIV wedging, and before the surgery, the wedging was uh, on FH five degree. And after the surgery, the wedging reversed in direction, 7.4 degree. And, and this uh, reverse wedging of the disc, distal to LIV did not improve with time. Uh, most common complication is pneumothorax. Uh, but most of the patient, the small amount of pneumothorax correct themselves without uh, intervention. Our result is comparable to the published data and I would like to draw your attention to the apical rotation correction. Um, it is also our experience that um, in terms of the anterior correction, because we did multiple uh, discectomy, it released uh, and released the, the curvature and improved the flexibility. And that's why we can achieve a very good um, rotational correction. So from the published result, um, we can, they can correct the rotation up to, um, on average, nearly 70%. Um, another consideration is that since anterior correction of the scoliosis is very powerful, um, some people may worry whether the thoracic curve can unbend without the surgery. And this publication confirmed that um, most of the thoracic curve, they can unbend to a certain degree. Um, and this unbend, spontaneous unbending of the thoracic curve will decrease with age. So for younger age patient, probably we can correct um, the lumbar or the thoracolumbar curve more. But for older patients, we need to be very careful. Uh, sometimes we may need to deliberately undercorrect the curve a little bit to make sure the postoperative uh, truncal balance. Um, some people also worry about the anterior approach, whether they jeopardize the pulmonary function. And it was shown that um, two years after the surgery, no matter anterior or posterior correction of the scoliosis, the pulmonary function were comparable. Um, anterior surgery also criticized the, um, the, the side effect of making the fused segment kyphosis. But as mentioned before, um, the kyphosization usually appear in the old day when we were using cable systems such as dryers or silky uh, system. But nowadays we are using a rigid rod system with fixed angle screw, um, the chance of having um, triposis uh, induction is not high. Um, so in summary, um, whether we should do an anterior or posterior surgery for thoracolumbar curve or thoracic curve. Well, in my opinion, if anterior or posterior surgery, we need to fuse the same uh, level, then um, we pro I probably will choose posterior surgery. And usually this kind of curve, they are more flexible curve. And then um, if for anterior correction, we need to go to L5, then uh, it is technically more difficult. And I personally will probably will do a posterior surgery. And this is an example of um, of case for illustration. This patient had uh, T11 to L4, 65 degree. Um, but the patient also present with back pain MRI showing that there's degeneration of L4-5. So um, in doing the surgery, we, we decided to go to L5. And that's why a um, posterior surgery was performed. Um, and as mentioned, this particular example, although the corpse angle is not very severe, but the patient has a lot of rotational element and, and, and the uh, curvature clinically is relatively stiff. Um, and that's why, and, and also anterior surgery, we can fuse um, from end to end and fuse soft. So we, we, we did anterior surgery. And as you can see, posterior surgery, even we can bring down the corpse angle to very satisfactory uh, small corpse angle. But um, in terms of the cosmetic result, the harm reduction, uh, I personally feel that anterior surgery can give better results. Um, and this is an example. Um, 
if we can save the motion segment, especially the distal motion segment, we, I personally will choose anterior surgery. So this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. Um, any questions? Yes, please, uh, Dr. Hegde. Yes, so it is good to segue from <clears throat> the anterior surgery to what I'm going to talk about. It reminds me of my old days, well, almost 20 years back when I started uh, doing deformity surgery and my preferred technique of correction was anterior. The only difference with uh, Dr. Wong's uh, technique is that I would use like harms recommended cages, especially at the lower lumbar levels. Thank you. Okay, um, perhaps we'll move to Dr. Hexi's talk, who's going to be talking about another anterior approach uh, to AIS. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The use of the term uh, tether and our preferred terminology for the new technique, non-fusion anterior scoliosis correction, will become clearer as I talk. Of course, uh, Harrington instrumentation was uh, something that we started almost 60 years back when Paul Harrington changed the way uh, the deformed spine was treated and uh, across the pond, uh, uh, across the pond, uh, around the same time in England, Sir John Chanley was restoring movement in painful arthritic hips. And this is pertinent, restoring mobility is pertinent to my talk. Uh, the technique of posterior, it's correct. No? Yes, sir. The technique of posterior correction and Fusion has evolved over the years and essentially meant iotrogenic ankylosis of a large part of the growing spine in children. Uh, the traditional teaching and practice was to look at the research charts to look for end of growth and to intervene for correction of the spinal deformity. So children with curves around 40 or 50 would wait for surgery and sometimes the deformity would increase rapidly to extreme degrees. Look at the graph on the le lower left side, which will frequently figure in my talk. It talks about, it mentions, or it uh, indicates peak hike, hike velocity when the child puts maximum growth. So here we have a boy whose deformity was 37 degrees, advised to wait, and when he presented to, to us, he had a deformity of 90 degrees in the primary curve. The crux of my argument today is that this traditional mindset has to change. Due to training, comfort, familiarity, regulations, like in North America, most surgeons prefer the posterior spinal correction. The comment on the left on, uh, that you see here is made by a renowned a uh, deformity surgeon and shows the general trend and bias. And like the previous speaker showed, a few of us are comfortable with anterior surgery and saw the definitive advantages of anterior scoliosis correction offered in specific deformities. And this comfort with the anterior approach is very pertinent to my talk today. Primarily under the influence of these two great guys, one taught me anterior scoliosis correction. You can recognize Dr. Z uh, Dr. Jürgen Harms on the left and Dr. Randy Betts on the right, who shared his passion for non-fusion surgery. So eight years back, we embarked on the non-fusion journey. 10-year-old child, RISA zero, pre <clears throat> Non-fusion done with slight undercorrection. Notice that there is still some residual deformity left. This is true growth modulation or 
the term VBT can, can be applied here. Four years later, she has spontaneously reduced, straightened up her uh, de uh, deformity now measures 4.7 degrees. You can see how beautiful she looks from the back. And as unlike uh, open no, fusion surgery, this is done through minimal invasive uh, uh, technique. I do not favor the endoscopic uh, technique. So if a new technique is based on inherently flawed concepts, it will certainly fail. Uh, and this has been seen in the history of spine surgery. Non-fusion has been around for over 15 years and has been getting a lot of traction. This is evident in the literature with the reports coming from several centers. But if we talk about poor outcomes and the reasons for it, it can be due to a poor understanding of the concept or case selection or surgical training or flawed implant design or one or more of these factors. So here I present two papers which had a considerable impact on the thinking about the concept of non-fusion. The paper on the left comes from North America, generally presented less than acceptable, uh, out acceptable outcomes. While the one on the right from Singapore presented a very short series of just five cases, but with very high number of significant adverse events prompting several surgeons to question the concept. Some even felt it was dangerous and the outcome was unpredictable. And of course, the editors of leading journals questioned the efficacy of the technique and the concept. This was not mirrored in our experience and we reported a year and a half back our outcomes, our outcomes in the first 75 back to five back cases we had done. We, in, we incidentally intentionally preferred to do it in the Asian Spine Journal. And to date, we have done a little over 150 cases. There have been no intraoperative and postoperative complications, except one child having postoperative atelectasis, necess necessitating a chest tube. I will talk about the chest tube shortly. So today in a 12-year-old RISA 3, Lenke 5 CN, it is very unlikely I will strip the lumbosacral paraspinal muscles to perform a posterior spinal fusion. Sure, as you see here on the right side, the tether may show breakage, yet she maintains good correction. Her sagittal profile is very nice, and the clinical pictures show she is very well balanced. So today our protocol is to perform the non-fusion correction based primarily on the flexibility uh, assessed on the awake traction film. And in the last 75 cases, we have stopped inserting chest tubes. The evening of the surgery, four hours later, the child ambulates and starts doing aggressive chest physiotherapy. She is ready to leave after spending one or two nights in the hospital. Excellent sagittal profile. Three months follow-up. And So the child is back to doing what she likes best at three months. So 12-year-old child, RISA 0, Sanders 3, Lenke 5. This brings us to the discussion of early intervention. The child's deformity already shows frontal shift, significant rotational displacement in November 2021. Non-fusion would have given an excellent result. The child could not undergo surgery for various reasons, and one can observe progression. Fortunately, the traction film shows good flexibility. And she has an excellent correction. So 
when we talk about uh, our assessment of curve, it is based on the degree of truncal shift, rotational, rotation of the vertebrae in the apical region, skeletal maturity, clinical deformity, and the per, per potential for curve progression. And we like to use non-fusion earlier rather than later. So here comes the classification which has been traditionally used. We have moved away from the RISA to the Sanders, but even the Sanders is now not good enough. And this busy slide goes into the details of the Sanders. Today, we use the thumb ossification composite index, which is a far more accurate way of monitoring growth even before the child reaches peak height velocity and therefore use more than more often than standards. So some, just one case before I stop, this is an outlier indication for non-fusion, 10 year old child, deformity notice three years back, deformity is progressive, research zero, he has a hemivertebrae D12 L1 with no cord abnormalities. Here you see it is almost like a double uh, uh, double, uh, uh, double curve deformity with a small element of kyphosis in the thoracolumbar region. He has a thoracolumbar hemivertebra. He has good flexibility. Here you see the hemivertebra. The MRI is normal. So if one were to do a hemivertebral excision and not address the spinal deformity, that would have been an issue. Perhaps the thoracic deformity would have progressed. Perhaps even the lumbar deformity would have progressed. So we did a hemivertebral excision. We did an anterior lumbar correction, non-fusion, and also addressed the thoracic deformity. At three months, he is looking good. At one and a half years, he is holding well and he is growing. The child is still growing. You can see his sagittal profile improves over, over the uh, period. His clinical follow up shows excellent balance and a good posture. So, to end, this, this is the kind of child we should look at. 11 year old, it is less than 30, 30 uh, 40 degrees, but it is, there is trunkal shifting. It is better that we address now rather than later. And this is what we have done. So tradition is a challenge to innovation, but that's where it goes. And the novel technique of non-fusion, he holds great promise and change is going to be the only constant as Heraclitus the Greek philosopher mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hegde. Um, a very, inch, uh, very nice talk. Um, maybe we have uh, time for one or two questions before we move on. So uh, I have a question for you uh, regarding uh, your great results. Um, uh, of course, you know, a lot of the studies out there, uh, e actually even our own um, experiences, the lumbar curves, uh, tether breakage is far more common um, because of the motion that is there. Uh, how is it that you have uh, such great results? Is there something we're missing? Uh, how can we improve our results? So uh, I, I, I think, <clears throat> well, we have, uh, I think one, it's cultural. Our children are smaller and I think your children are small as well. Uh, you know, the BMI is less than maybe the Caucasian children and that also we like to address the, the uh, flexible deformities and early. So when you ad address them early, that is that gives you a good result. The third thing is we have moved from the uh, four millimeter, yes, four mil right. millimeter thickness raw uh, uh, cords to the five millimeter thickness. And I think that will improve further. Finally, even if the cord breaks at one year, a, as I showed, it may not matter. And unlike the broken rod, it does not cause pain. Great, thank you.
Dalton, you have any uh, yeah, you have questions? <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Hady, uh, I, I share uh, Jason's uh, sentiments. Your result seems, seems to be far better than the rest of the uh, groups. Can I ask you, what's your indication for surgery? So uh, the time that was given to me was very limited. I would have liked to talk in greater detail about the awake traction film that we use and our criteria for case selection and our protocols for case selection. So for us, the awake traction film is the most important investigation to decide whether uh, I would go with non-fusion or with fusion. And if you do a traction, what's a threshold for you to decide to go, to go for? So surgery? the correction should be, I, uh, Dr. Sharon, my, uh, my, my spine fellow, he would be able to tell you that we look for more than 50%, 50, 50%, 50 flexibility. Right. How about the cop angle without traction? So that we keep that in mind. So that's why if it is over 75 or 80, those are not good indications in our city, in our mind for the non-fusion. And what, what about boom maturity index? Uh, that's not such a, we have been using this in older children as well. So we, we, we are not using it as a growth modulating technique. We are using it almost like, uh, uh, like the previous speaker, a non-fusion uh, non way to address the same way as he addresses with fusion. Okay. Anterior. Thank you. Yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah, yeah please. please. Yeah, thank you for the uh, and congratulations for good results. I have two questions from your the cases. The one is the young child walking after four hours uh, operation. Yeah, it's very early ambulation. What's the meaning of uh, leather walk so early? So in child, uh, long period of bed uh, reading doesn't cause any problem such as DVT or something. So. I, uh, oh, uh, very yeah. painful times. <laughs> what is the no, no, no. second no. question is you did a uh, uh, fusion thorax and lumbar in a, a congenital scoliosis. Actually, my idea is that the thoracic curvature is a secondary curvature to the lumbar from the congenital hemi vertebra. So if we do a hemivertebral excision and the fusion uh, upper and lower vertebral with a short fusion, then the thoracic curvature, secondary curvature will be get straightened. So what's the reason, uh, rationale doing going up to thoracic uh, the fusion technique? If, if we go back to that child, we at least we found that the thoracic part of the deformity was structural. Yes, one could have ju just done uh, excision of the hemi vertebra and just fixed one vertebra above and below. But we were worried about the extent of deformity in a 10-year-old growing child. So that is why we do uh, often do hemi vertebra excision if it is causing what we call as a junctional deformity. This was more similar to, uh, no, uh, to a, a double and you know, like an adult's an idiopathic curve with a uh, structural thoracic and of course, a lumbar curve due to the ME vertebra. So that's the reason why we thought we would use and also have a technique which would allow him to grow. He's just 10 years old. So we did not want to do like a long posterior fusion or uh, just address the thoracic, I mean the uh, ME vertebra. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so um, let's move on to Prof. Sue's uh, final talk before we f finish the cases, um, MIS and AI surgery. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, and uh, I'm glad to share the, my experience at the ASICON and the APSS meeting. So my topic is about the minimal invasive surgery for pediatric spinal deformity. The trend of spine surgery is uh, MIS or endoscopic surgery. But still, the scoliosis done with the conventionally wide opening procedure, leaving the long scar like this. And the patient, some patients do a tattooing to hide the scar. 
So would it be possible to do MIS in scoria surgery like this uh, using a tubular system, which is used in a, a, the disectomy or stenosis fusion? So it's our technique. Uh, make a four centimeter short uh, incision, uh, similar to the coin hole, coin size. And through this hole, the, put the pedicle screw and uh, we do a facet joint fusion uh, for the uh, by grinding and do a bone fusion here. We use the uh, guided wire for the cannula screw and uh, we put the six or seven screws through one hole here and the other uh, incision is made at the uh, distally for lumbar area fusion. So Nowadays, we don't use this tubular system. Instead, we use a right angle retractor for convenience and easy handling. So after putting, then we do a thoracoplasty. Nowadays, we use a burr instead of a kerosene runger. Then the rod is inserted through the hole and assembled. And the later, Procedure is uh, similar to uh, with the conventional uh, method, uh, do a rather derotation, and then we can have a correction. This is a real view. Uh, inside four centimeter and do a, a thoracoplasty and the screw is inserted using a tubular retractor. Nowadays, we don't use a tubular retractor. Instead, we use a right angle retractor. And then through this hole, the screw is inserted. So uh, expose the facet joint. We use the facet joint as the landmark. And the screw is inserted through this hole. So our the is entry point is here, the base of a facet joint. So for easiness of a screw insertion, we use a, a cannula screw and guided wire. And the facet joint grounding you know, for the facet joint fusion. And we put the bone graft here, bone material. Then move to next area, then step by step do and yeah, screw insertion and to rod insertion. And uh, a rather length is uh, adjusted, and uh, after that, the the rather rotation is the same as the conventional method. Uh, this is a new uh, another way. Nowadays we use a, a right angle retractor system. So instead of a, a Tubular, we use a right angle for the easiness and the convenience. So the other method is the same. The use a guided wire for the cannula screw insertion. And uh, after inserting six or seven screws approximately, then we move to the distal. The same procedure. Bring a bone graft and uh, yeah, pre uh, contour rod is inserted and the rod is uh, uh, assembled on the skin. After that, uh, do a derotation maneuver and uh, lock the screw by the capping. Uh, this the case, this the same. Okay, the most important uh, point is the insertion of a screw because the skin, the the operation field is limited. So we use uh, the facet joint orientation instead of a transverse process because the transverse orientation 
the transverse process is deformed and deeply located and requiring a wider dissection. We don't use a transverse uh, uh, landmark system. Instead, we use uh, this uh, facet joint base uh, uh, landmark system. Actually, here, this is the uh, entry point uh, for lumbar. This is the base of uh, facet joint here. So interestingly, this is the facet joint, it's a base. Here, this is the entry point. Interestingly, uh, there are many uh, the landmark uh, systems uh, uh, presented by other authors, but they give only the entry point. But if you use the facet joint orientation, you can have the, some orientation for the trajectory. That is the most important one. Actually, this is the entry point here, this time here, and you can see. And so trajectory regarding this kind of uh, deformity is very difficult to insert a screw. But interestingly, this is the real situation like the uh, rotated vertebra. This is the facet joint, facet joint. If you see, it is a perpendicular right angle uh, orientation of facet joint is a right angle uh, to the face, the pedicle. So like this, facet orientation, facet joint surface, and the pedicle is a 90 degree in many cases. Uh, here, facet surface, and this is the pedicle. So if you uh, use this uh, facet surface orientation, you can have the some orientation for the trajectory also. So it's the same. They, this is the, let's assume that this is the facet surface. Then is the pedicle. Entry point is the base here. The right angle relationship is maintained. Whatever the rotation of the deformity is, is quite interesting. That so um, the same. So this is the facet. The put the pedicle. Entry point is here, and the. Uh, Trajectory is perpendicular to surface. And here, if you see, uh, 90 degree, the right angle relationship is maintained. I don't know why, but it's interesting. That, yeah. If you see in your radiogram, this is the uh, scoliosis with the rotation. This is the rear CT radiogram with the rotated one. The T9 is the apex. If you see here, it's a facet surface. It has a 90 degree relationship here. 10 uh, tenth thorax, 90 degree. It's the eighth. So, so if you consider the this uh, uh, surface orientation, you can have the some orientation for the trajectory. If you see, it's a fifth, the perpendicular, uh, six and seven also. 10 has a 90 degree. It's a 11 also has a 90 degree. Even in a rotated uh, uh, vertebra scoliotic curvature, they have a right angle relationship with the basal surface and the pedicle. It's quite interesting. Using this technique, we put the pedicle screw with a very narrow uh, operation field. And uh, another for, the, actually this is, uh, my concept is a cosmetic surgery. So to make a very short incision in a precise area, we put the uh, uh, needle mark uh, preoperatively, and then we do a bending uh, to have a redundancy skin so that we can retract easily, yeah? So by doing this technique, uh, we can move to up and down and put we can put the pedicle screw up to six to seven screws per using this one hole and another hole. Uh, if you make a bending like this, the excursion is short and easy to insert screw by direction. And this is the baggy skin uh, cat. They are very redundant. So in case of a cat, we can use only one incision. This is the case. And later, uh, we needed to insert uh, this uh, hammer back before so this uh, insertion is uh, used to, uh, to hide uh, uh, another incision. 
if you insert the this uh, head percutaneously, it requires a two centimeter of uh, long incision. But if you separately insert uh, this one first and later assembling this uh, head on the skin, then you can have uh, only one centimeter, which can be used later for hemoback line, uh, just uh, hiding the one scar. This is technique. Percutaneously, we we make a stab wound using the number ten screw or uh, number ten mess, and uh, percutaneous under the vision of uh, 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 entry point, we do uh, percutaneously insert. And then second hour is inserted. And guide wire is inserted. And here the yeah, the screw head inserted on the skin, not through the this one, because it causes a longer incision. Later, the this screw head is assembled with this uh, threaded screw on the skin. Then we can uh, save the scar and later this incision is used for the uh, hemoback. And the correction rate is almost similar, 70 degree. And the bleeding loss is uh, uh, quite less than the conventional. So anyway, the curb angle correction is very similar. The upper range of uh, curvature that we can manage is uh, I think 80 degree. So I will show you the, some case. And this is the done from T3 to L4. Uh, it's uh, many screws. But fortunately, we were able to uh, make uh, two incisions. Short, sure. then 60 and 60. We did uh, from T4 to L1, 2, 3, 4 here. With the short is, uh, it, this uh, length of the scar is similar to the scar uh, leaving after disectomy or further removal of a honey disc. And this is the, another case, 83 degrees of curvature using a small scar here and here. So we were able to get a, a nice correction. And this is a, a 70, 70 degree curvature. We went down to L4 and uh, later the scar get uh, thinned and the very scar is less. So, yeah, thank you for attention. Thank you for a great talk. Um, maybe one or two questions before we move to the cases. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, it, uh, what you have shown is need we need excellent uh, surgical skills for insertion of screws uh, through such a small incision. Uh, it was awesome to see. Uh, so uh, my questions uh, uh, the how how you uh, 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 how you manage the pseudo arthrosis component which is uh, what we all are worried about and um, yeah. Uh, yeah and uh, yeah, how you select how you select uh, cases apart from cops is also a flexibility a component for you yeah good question so pseudo uh, arthrosis is the main the concern when we started we did the MIS procedure for nine years. So it, interestingly, I don't know. Actually, the, the bone graft is not good, uh, likely the conventional uh, surgery because the operation field is narrow. But interestingly, no shoot arthrosis or breakage develop. I think that reason is the young child, maybe adolescent, 15 years or the, around, they have a good bone healing. And the second, they have a good musculature, the protecting the some bone uh, collapsing. So that might be the reason. So interesting, that's the enigma also I also have. So if we do a CT radiogram, we can check the, whether the bony uh, fusion mass was obtained or not, but we couldn't do take the CT in every patient. So we don't know, uh, thank you. And uh, for the uh, selection of uh, coverture, so we usually do uh, MIS as we uh, get uh, more experience. We found that the 80 degree of coverture with some rigidity is also correctable with this maneuver. Uh, thank you. Dr. Heidi. Yeah. So uh, it's an excellent, excellent talk. 
uh, and uh, this concept of the right angle for the trajectory for the uh, pedicle screw is uh, is is wonderful. Uh, I, I, I would, uh, in light-hearted manner, ask you whether you allow your children to walk four or five hours after surgery. After you do, after all, you're doing minimal invasive. Yeah, actually, the yeah, good question. <laughs> I, I, the patient cannot walk after four hours like your patient. Usually, after three days of operation, they started to go to toilet. Okay. Three days later. And after five days, they walk uh, with some assistant and they go freely walk after seven days and they discharge at seven days. Yeah, thank you. Okay. That's, that's quite a long, uh, long <laughs> recovery. I'm not sure if it's uh, due to the, a lot of subfascial uh, yeah. issues. Uh, Dr. Wong, maybe one more question. Um, very good. Good talk. Um, I, I also use the joint surface for my open posterior surgery school insertion. But on the concave side, most of the time the joint surface is small. So um, in open surgery, I can uh, have other anatomy, anatomical structure to guide my school insertion. So um, I am not sure on concave side, when the joint is very deformed or very really small, how do you use uh, the joint surface to guide your school insertion? Yeah, good question. So even in a the concave side, or so there are some uh, joint space. Joint space is open. Uh, you can do a dissection. If you do a dissection using a, a bobby, the bobby, wait, yeah, we call it a bobby dissection. Kobe, Kobe? Yeah, uh, bobby dissection, you can find the joint line. Joint gap is always existing. That if you if we find the joint gap, then we use that uh, orientation as a trajectory. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Doctor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for a great presentation. I'm always amazed with your technique. All right, that's a wonderful technique. Uh, my question is that first, um, after the operation, do how do you close the deep fascia? Uh, question one. Uh, question two is, in the event you do not close the defacia, do you experience massive bruises of the skin uh, in day two and day three post-operatively? Yeah, good question. So, you know, open area, uh, we can, uh, easy to close, but, you know, distal and the proximal area, uh, there, there are some difficulty. And uh, we just try to put the needle holder deeply as far as we can. But uh, fortunately, it, if the, the fascia is uh, closed at the proximally and distally deep, there's some uncovered on suture the area is not so big. So no wound problem causes. Uh, thank you. And secondly, the apical area has the most uh, difficult access for the suture, yeah, fascia suture. So uh, fortunately, the Apical area has uh, some concavity, so not prominent. So uh, it doesn't uh, really cause the skin problem or prominence of bone. So yeah, it's true. We have uh, some difficulty. We may need uh, some special instrument to further <laughs> repair of, uh, the fascia in the black zone area. Yeah. Dr. Su, uh, last question. Uh, sorry, I am not able to control myself. I'm, I will love to apply your technique in uh, coming uh, cases of mine. Hence, I'm asking this question. So how you have been inserting these screws, uh, five to six screws through a small incision, uh, is it a free hand you take the fluoroscopic shoot as well? Or do we need these special screws uh, for doing this uh, MIS with a guide wire? Okay, that is question one. And uh, se second question is whether this is MIS, uh, which, is, which should be biological tissue preserving or just a, a, a small incision surgery because anyway we are retracting the soft tissue, uh, putting the screw aligned to the end plate through a same entry what we all uh, go for by stripping the soft tissue. So uh, yeah. how biological preserving is it? Yeah, good question. So for the screw insertion, so we use uh, the, the right angle relationship with the face head joint and the, we check the 
uh, see young when we have a difficulty of insertion, uh, not frequent, but uh, sometimes. And uh, we check the the violation using the bolty proof, yeah, to check whether the screw hole was made uh, rightly or not. So yeah. And fortunately, the patient bone is not so uh, tough. So if we put the second hole, then you follow the, the cortical tube of a pedicle. So very uh, not difficult to insert. And the second question was the soft tissue injury by retraction. Yeah, a good question. So sometimes the skin edge is dirt. From the long uh, retraction, possible retractions, then we the, let the assistant to, to push the skin retract so that we can we have a, a, a redundancy of skin. That's the reason why we put the patient in a bent reverse bent position, and then after that, the, when finally we do assembly, we make the uh, operation table in a flat position. In that time, we have uh, some difficulty of uh, racking the screw, but do a forceful skin retraction and the assistant to do a skin retraction. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we can proceed, uh, Dr. Jason. Yeah, let's move on to the case discussion. Um, so, Dr. Tushar, you're you're presenting the first case. Please go yes. ahead. Yeah, so good afternoon and good evening to everyone. And um, thank you for ASSI and APSS for giving this opportunity. Since uh, we discussed the cases about the thoracolumbar curve, so I'm going to begin with a case, uh, a 16-year-old female who had a progressive deformity and she had also back pain, which was there since two years. And the birth history was uneventful and there was no any syndromes. A patient had achieved menarche at the age of 13 and she was skeletally mature at the time of presentation. So uh, uh, the, the clinical images showed the head was centered. There was minimal right shoulder elevation. You can see there's a trunk which is shifted to the left, uh, causing an increased arm trunk distance on the left side. And there's a deep flank crease, which can be appreciated on the right side of the patient. Uh, so the uh, sagittal uh, parameter wise, she was uh, okay, uh, but you can see that the, the thoracic rib bump is minimal, but there's a uh, lumbar rib bump, uh, which is usually not so prominent in spite of curve being on a higher side. There were no other neurocutaneous marker in this particular patient. So this is the uh, measurements. You can see that the proximal curve D1 to D4 uh, was uh, non-structural. D5 to D9 was 39.7 degree. And the main and major curve was D9 to L3, which was 62.2 degree. Uh, uh, again, the sagittal parameters, uh, we had a T5 to D12 angle, which was 51.6 degree. That's why it's lengthy 5C plus. Uh, the T10 to L2 was uh, 5.6 degree, so not much of major thoracolumbar kyphosis. But what we do notice stable sagittal vertebra was L2 because more than the 50% of the vertebra was lying anterior. The last touch vertebra was L4 here and the T10 to L2 uh, angle was 5.6 degree in a coronal plane. The apical vertebral translation was 9 millimeter in a thoracic area and lumbar area it was 40 millimeter. And another particular point which I would like to draw uh, attention at the end of the presentation is the L3 translation from the midline. It was 40 millimeter uh, uh, from the midline. So the bending X-ray showed a very uh, flexible thoracolumbar curve. It was bending to uh, almost 11 degree. The, the, the thoracic curve was in fact slightly stiffer. It was bending to 23.5 degree, but it was non-structural. We routinely don't do CT scan, but in this patient, the MRI showed uh, no neuroaxial abnormality. Uh, this is the uh, current situation that we have a curve, which is predominantly a thoracolumbar curve, non-structural thoracic curve. Uh, I, I would like to really uh, like to know the opinion of the house uh, with respect to the Fusion levels here. Can we see the bending film again? Uh, so the thoracic cow is bending very well. The thoracic cow is coming to twenty three point five degree.
So my question will be again, if we plan to do a thoracolumbar instrumentation, whether uh, where one would like to stop at L3, L4, what with the LIV? Um, perhaps start with me first because I I, I gave the talk uh, on anterior correction. For for this particular patient, I probably will do anterior surgery. Um, I think we can save one possible and one distal motion segment. Um, I will fuse and correct the deformity from T10 to L3. Um, if I do posteriorly, I think this curve is relatively flexible. Uh, having said that. Um, because of the slight trunkle shift um, and the last touching vertebra is L4. So posteriorly, um, I think doing uh, fusion down to L4 is safe, although I cannot say uh, posteriorly fuse to L3 definitely will fail. But um, um, I think for anterior, I'm quite sure stopping at L3 should be okay. Uh, that's my opinion. Thank you very much. Point is well taken. I think there are a lot of studies which are shown with the pedicle screw instrumentation and rigid cobalt curve rod. Uh, we are able to achieve the posteriorly also the similar result like N vertebra to N vertebra, uh, which are done by anteriorly as nicely shown by you in your presentation. And same was uh, tried in this particular case. So we decided to go from D9 to L3. Uh, uh, we didn't want it to fuse the thoracic curve. Uh, the approach was posterior. And uh, this was uh, done uh, for this patient. So we are gone from the uh, all posterior approach, D9 to L3. Uh, we have been able to horizontalize the L3 LIV uh, uh, level. And uh, uh, these are the, uh, the images. The, uh, the, uh, again, these are type 5 Lenke curve. When you are instrumenting from the backside, uh, there's a lot of literature which talks about the uh, selection of LIV, which I'm going to say in a, a subsequent slide and this is what was done both are cobalt chrome rods and all uh, and we, we we not gone to l4 level uh these were the clinical images uh, for the patient uh, for d9 to l3 level uh, we uh, have been able to correct the flank asymmetry uh, significantly uh, from the both side and uh, these are the 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 front profile the flank asymmetry is uh, now uh, corrected from the both side and uh, uh, so uh, regarding the selection, as I was mentioning, uh, there are a lot of research and which talks about the L3 translation. So the L3 translation from the midline uh, is something which is uh, uh, to be taken considered uh, if you are planning to fuse short at L3 from the posterior level. If your translation of the L3 is more than 30, 35 millimeter as per the literature, there are various paper, then you have a chance of getting a distal adding on. But if you are, uh, if your uh, translation of L3 is uh, not more than 35 millimeter in the uh, the uh, the supine uh, the standing view, then you can very well stop at L3. The second talked about point is the L3 tilt. So if you have a tilt which is more than uh, 10 degree, then yes, uh, you can have a distal uh, adding on in our patient. It was uh, six, six degree. So we could correct it back to the uh, almost four degree and we could horizontalize it. So these are the two important points which literature talks about while selecting the L3 as a fusion level in a type 5 linky AIS. Thank you for the time. Uh, Dr. Haig, do you have a question or comment? Uh, well, uh, I just wanted to tell my young young colleague from Bombay, Tushar, that uh, we have, uh, even when we do our fusion cases, we rely on the traction film. And as regards the whether to stop at L3 or L4, we always do our uh, deformities uh, uh, per operatively also on traction. So they have, uh, they have uh, tongs on the head and they have leg traction. And we see how the, if we take an AP shot to understand where the L4 and L, L3. And very often we may have planned to go to L4, but we can stop at L3. So that's how we decide stopping uh, uh, one vertebra short. Having said that, for us, the traction film, which even your bend film shows quite a lot of flexibility in the lumbar curve. And this is better correlated on a traction film. And for us, this would be an ideal case for a non-fusion selective for the thoracolumbar uh, curve. 
point well taken uh, dr sajan sir so i think uh, there's a lot of uh, literature which talks about the how to select the uiv uh, the liv in a type 5 and it is always l3 or versus l4 so yes the preoperative bedding and the flexibility will give a guide but these are the two objective parameter which have a, a maximum level of evidence with respect to selection of fusion levels Great. Um, okay, let's lock them. You want to finish us off with the last case, please. Okay. So I'm trying to sh share my screen now. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for the invitation from uh, ASSI and APSS. I'm tasked with uh, discuss with the MIS uh, case discussion. So this is uh, my patient. She is 18 year old female and she presented with what looks like a EIS uh, curve. The shoulder was uh, balanced. Uh, the axial triangle rotation was 15 degrees on the right side across the rib uh, prominence area. Uh, lumbar bolster was quite minimal at five degrees uh, on the left side. The shoulder is higher uh, from behind uh, on the right side, but anteriorly, you look at it, it's quite uh, even across. And when you measure the curve itself, it's measured around 47 degrees. It bends down to 25 degrees. Uh, she has no other uh, medical issues. She was uh, has a normal birth uh, history, and her reser is uh, 5. So... I would just uh, stop now and ask the panel, uh, what would you do uh, for this case? Uh, anyone want to uh, give it a, a go? Given that- the I see, actually, uh, I, a Joy is here. Maybe we should ask a Joy. He's been uh, silent all night. <laughs> you have to look at the what the patient was. This is a riser five. Skeletally mature patient. You discuss with the patient that probably it's likely to progress. We need to follow the child up maybe every year or once in two years. But if the child is cosmetically concerned, worried, then probably we can offer a surgery for only fixation of the type 1 curve, the thoracic component. How about the uh, level selection? Anyone want to go? And anterior versus posterior? I'm a posterior guy. It's simple. Dr. Sajan? So uh, recently we had almost uh, the same age uh, lady, uh, 18, 19. She was a medical uh, student or a grad, uh, just started medicine. And she had this type 1 lengthy curve thoracic, uh, with hypolordosis of the thoracic spine. And uh, she... So she, she had done her research and came all the way. She came from a, another country and she had the, almost the same degree of flexibility, more than 50% of flexibility. And she did not want a fusion surgery. So with all these things in mind, and since she was still flexible, like your, uh, this, uh, this patient, uh, we told her that we can do an anterior non-fusion, but her rib hump, like, as your patient has, uh, the rib hump uh, will correct, but may not correct as well as with posterior uh, surgery. And she finally underwent non-fusion. So your technique is a non-fusion technique in this case for visa 5 patient? Yes. Right, okay. Uh, anyone else uh, would have other selection? Uh, Dr. Wong? Um, I agree with uh, Ajoy that uh, this patient's indication for surgery is for the night. So if, um, uh, I think observation is one, and if the patient really want cosmetic correction, I, I'm also happy to do surgery, and I probably will just offer a simple, straightforward posterior instrumental fusion. Since, um, this is uh, in thoracic spine, the curve is not really long. So just a end-to-end a -end posterior um, thoracic fusion will, will, will settle the problem. That is my preference. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, for this case, uh, I went on to do uh, the uh, lung function test. Uh, expected the amount 
respiratory uh, restrictive lung disease, uh, not too significant. She doesn't have any breathlessness. Uh, and I went on to do an uh, anterior surgery. So we do a thoracoscopic a deformity correction, a fusion surgery. Uh, the indication often is in the lanky one uh, curve, like such as what you see in here. But of course, we have to bear in mind that a uh, contraindication would be things like uh, if the patient is not able to tolerate single lung ventilation or even in the case of significant uh, core pulmonary. So for, for her, uh, we went in, uh, we used uh, 3579 uh, ports over the ribs, uh, so four small incisions, and uh, we uh, insert the screw targeted through the ports created uh, with a small, uh, smaller ports uh, to retract the diaphragm away, uh, usually at the umbilicus area, a small port, 5mm ports over the area. So for her, uh, I insert the ports, I went in, and uh, you can see on the scope that as I inspect around the the uh, the lungs, the lungs uh, at this stage has been fully deflated. Uh, but as you can see, there is a small, what looks like a small adhesion at the lower loop to the chest wall. You can see the uh, pots uh, on top. So this is upside down view. Okay, so the uh, lung is uh, here to the, uh, the chest wall. This patient did not have any previous surgery before. So can I stop here and ask uh, Dr. Sajan and see whether you will proceed with the surgery at this stage? Uh, what would you do here? Uh, if I was caught in this situation uh, with the chest open, and I would just call the uh, my cardiothoracic uh, colleague uh, to come and release that uh, that adhesion and take the lung away so that I can. Uh, my preference, even if I do anterior, is to do through uh, anterior small incisions. So I, I I am not trained in thoracoscopic. So I don't know what you would do in a, in a thoracic uh, thoracoscopic situation. But even then, we would call, still call uh, the thoracic surgeon to okay. release that that band. Uh, Dr. Wong, did you have such a situation before? Um, I, I also do open if I do anterior. So I, I'm also not good uh, using the, 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 for, uh, for, uh, the endoscope. Yeah, so what I did in this case was that I did a release for, for this patient. And of course, uh, like, you know, you, uh, the rest of you guys, I do uh, call in the cardiac thoracic to make sure there's no air leak after the release. So they came in. They helped me to uh, apply the uh, snow, which is a fibula surgical cell, uh, onto the lung. Uh, they are satisfied that there's no air leak. And of course, uh, we proceeded with the surgery subsequently uh, without uh, much issues. So this is to show that I secured the segmental vessels through the ports. Uh, the segmental vessels uh, being secured using harmonic scalpel. And subsequent to that, uh, of course, uh, we do a discectomy uh, through the ports. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, can see quite clearly. Uh, we can separate out the end plates uh, using an instrument uh, called ultra cut. Uh, after the separation of the end plates, uh, then of course uh, we can do a formal discectomy. And of course the rib graft has then been uh, harvested, and this can be put through uh, the funnel onto the uh, onto the uh, the defect created. Then last, of course, you know we. Uh, tap uh, at the uh, correct site. And often this will be where the segmental vessels uh, originate uh, from, uh, and then uh, followed by the screw. So last, of course, uh, we can deliver across uh, the uh, area uh, to the pots. Uh, that's what you see uh, on the X-ray. Uh, we managed to reduce it uh, down to uh, uh, perhaps around 10 degrees or so. Uh, it's important during the uh, cantilever maneuver uh, to use uh, to create a little bit of bend at the proximal aspect so that the screw doesn't pull out. So post-op care, we uh, put the chest tube in for the patient, uh, underwater seal drain uh, for about two or three days, and often this will be removed on day three. HP was uh, dropped uh, from 13.7 to 12.5. The approximate blood loss was less than 300 mils, uh, and patient uh, was discharged on day four. So this is a one-week uh, post swap picture you can, after uh, post uh, chest tube removal, you can see uh, the planting of the costophrenic angle, and this resolve uh, 
in about a month's time. This is a patient's uh, latest uh, picture, one and a half years post-op. Uh, I can see that uh, correction is maintained. Fusion is achieved uh, in some of the areas. The ATR has reduced to less than five degrees uh, post-surgery. So reported outcome for patient with MIS deformity correction uh, at five years uh, by our centers is around 80%. Uh, thoracic kyphosis uh, can be uh, improved from uh, 19 degree uh, to 20 degree uh, uh, post-surgery. Uh, again, blood loss is around 300 mils. Uh, often, uh, these kind of cases would not have any issue with the uh, reoperation in regards to the wound. Uh, they often resulted as what Dr. Wong said earlier on, less uh, fusion level, uh, less, less blood loss uh, compared to posterior group uh, of patients. Complication reported will include uh, things like mucus plugging, atelectasis, 3% uh, of implant uh, breakage has been reported with one required uh, revision. Uh, they, uh, some patients may potentially have wing scapula this is due to the access uh, to the ports, uh, particularly at the uh, third port, uh, third rib ports, where the long thoracic nerve uh, may be encountered. So in summary, MIS deformity correction is viable in a selected patients. Uh, steeper learning curves are expected for surgeons and anesthetists. Uh, also be prepared to deal with unexpected occurrence, such as what we see in here, which probably is adhesion of the lung. Uh, good outcomes can be achieved in a very well-selected patients and has advantage compared to uh, conventional posterior surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Lachlan. Uh, great uh, finish and uh, smack on five o'clock. Um, Ajoy, are you, are you giving the vote of thanks or finishing up? Uh, did it. Did it. Yes, oh, dear, okay. Yeah, so thank you all the esteemed faculties from EPSS for joining us. Thank you, uh, ASSI President-elect Dr. Srivastav and thank you all my colleagues Dr. Ajay, Dr. Sajan Hegre and Dr. Tushar Rathor uh, from, uh, for joining us in that busy schedule. I thank you uh, APSS, uh, all the team, uh, ASSI for giving us the opportunity and uh, I will conclude uh, this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.